Hi everyone, I'm Frank Pleshak and the Battle of Lake Narroch in World War I is a little known but highly significant battle. And before I start, I'd like to make a couple of apologies. The first is that I'm going to use a selection of Old English, Polish, German and Russian maps and then flick between them as I feel necessary. Secondly, uh, I'm going to use a combination of names for various cities and towns. Uh, as some of them were known differently in, in, in different languages. For example, Vilnius, which we know was Vilno to, uh, to the Poles, uh, it was and, and Vilna to the Germans. And lastly, I apologise if I hopelessly pronounce any of these names wrong or any of the names that I use hopelessly wrong. And as an introduction for those of, the, those of you that don't know me, I'm actually going to start my talk a few years later on the eve of World War II. So, as we all know, this is what Poland looked like on the uh, 31st of August 1939. Lake Naroc, here, is a large clear lake in what was a popular resort of the Kresy region of eastern Poland, about 100 kilometres to the east of the Polish cultural city of Vilno. So, here we have Lake Naroc in the middle of the map here. It's in uh, the middle of an area of many lakes, marshes and dense forests. Only a single river flows out of Lake Naroc, down here to the south. Uh, it was actually the, uh, the border during the second partition of Poland. It flows into the, uh, the Vileja, uh, then into the Niemen, then out into the Baltic Sea. And Lake Naroc itself is actually the largest of three almost connected lakes. So we've got Lake Naroc, Lake Maastra and Lake Batorin. And Lake Naroc is actually about 11 kilometres at its longest and about 9 kilometres at its widest. The nearest town is Kabilnik. And in 1920, my dad was born in this little village here called Schwagsti. So, we all know what happened on the uh, 1st of September 1939. Germany invaded from the west, and then just over two weeks later, Russia invaded from the east on the 17th of September. My dad uh, was actually arrested by the NKVD and sent to the dreaded Kolyma. Um, fortunately, none of the other members of his family were, though two of his younger brothers were later deported by the Germans to Dachau and miraculously both survived. My book describes his story and for about the last 10 years I've, I've written about Polish history and helped people with their family searches. Anyway, my dad was eventually released, joined Anders army and settled in Manchester and hence I'm here and able to tell you his story. Though he was never allowed to go back home uh, to his village which is now in Belarus and he never had any contact with any of his family members ever again until the day he died in 1994. But, but after the, the fall of the Soviet Union and the advent of the internet, we were able to make contact with his family in Belarus and eventually go to his village, which hadn't changed much in over a hundred years. They had no idea what had happened to him and his sister was still living in the same wooden house that my dad was born in. On a recent visit, I even met these two lovely neighbours, Olga and Ekaterina, who remembered my dad. We, we took some of my dad's ashes and spread them on his father's grave in Kabilnik. There were lots of Polish graves, a Jewish memorial, and I noticed a huge memorial to the German army, dated 1916. Although I pride myself in uh, my historical knowledge, I couldn't understand why there was a, a German memorial to World War I. In my ignorance, I didn't even know there was conflict in the East in World War I. So when I got home, I started to read up, but there was hardly anything written in English. In fact, there was almost nothing at all written about it in the West. Eventually, I obtained some Russian and German documents which I had translated, and I was amazed at the massive, brutal and significant battle that had taken place there. So, back to the beginning of World War I. Poland, as a sovereign nation, didn't exist. It had been partitioned for almost 120 years. Lake Naroc was, Lake Naroc was deep inside Russian, the Russian Empire. 
Uh, Russia had actually mobilised on uh, the first day of the war, but its first involvement in combat was on the 17th of August 1914, when the Russian Imperial Army invaded East Prussia. In a full-scale offensive, General Pavel Rennenkamp's Russian First Army attacked from the northeast, while General Alexander Samsonov's Russian Second Army attacked from the south. Initial uh, Russian success against the German Eighth Army, first at the Battle of Stalyponen, here, was followed by the Battle of Gumbinen, uh, which resulted in the German General von Prittwitz suggesting a retreat of the German army to the west of the Vistula and the total abandonment of East Prussia. Not surprisingly, it was a suggestion totally unacceptable to the German General Staff. Von Prittwitz was immediately removed and replaced by von Hindenburg. His action was swift, and by the end of August he had stopped the two Russian invading armies, first at the Battle of Tannenberg, uh, which was in August 1914, and then swiftly routed them at the First Battle of the Majorian Lakes um, in September 1914, and then the Second Battle of the Majorian Lakes in February 1915. The Central Powers counter-attacked and pushed eastwards along the whole of its eastern front. The Russian Great Retreat of 1915 had started. They pulled further and further back, hoping to buy time in order to regroup for a counter-offensive. As they did so, they created a zone of destruction using a large-scale scorched earth strategy, destroying anything that they might be of use to the enemy, including crops, houses, railways and sometimes entire villages and towns. Anything of value that could be transported and removed was taken away, and they also forcibly removed large numbers of residents, many of those from Polish territory, which then were moved to the southeast of Petrograd. The German 10th Army had by mid August taken the strategically important fortress at Kaunas, but then found the capture of Vilno altogether harder. They simply regrouped and with reinforcements bypass Vilno uh, and broke through the Russian lines in the so-called Svensiani Gap, which was here. Uh, German cavalry units pressed on through Postavi towards Globokie, but the bulk of the forces headed southeastwards towards the cities of Molidechno and Minsk. Uh, I'm going to digress a little bit here. Molidechno was also the site of the notorious German World War II Sarg 342 and Katyn, not Katyn, uh, where there is a memorial to the villages obliterated by the German army is also nearby. Molidechno was also the place where my dad was put on a train to Siberia in 1940. It was the last time his feet ever touched Polish soil and it was also the same train station where I arrived in Belarus the first time I went. Uh, when I went, arrived from uh, Lithuania. Anyway, back to World War One. By mid-September, the Russian 6th Cavalry Corps had captured the towns of Vileka and Smolgorny, and some cavalry units were pushing on towards Molidechno. Stavka, the Russian High Command, were clearly concerned. Not only was Molidechno uh, an important railway crossroads, but it also contained important secret government and military installations. On the 17th of September, as the German 10th Army began to surround Vilno, Russian forces were withdrawn and the city was ceded to the Germans. But, but as the German army had marched east, their supply lines had increased and become severely stretched. Russia's though had shortened and their material losses from earlier on in the war had, be, had been made good from increased production back at home and supplies supplied from France and England. The Russian Second Army that had been devastated at Tannenberg and then obliterated at the Majorian Lakes had regrouped and reformed and under General Smirnov were given the honour to finally halt the German advance. The Russian Second Army, supported by the 10th, struck back and immediately halted the German advance before Molodechno. And they pushed the German Germans back north along a 40 kilometre stretch of the river Vileja, uh, back to around the town of Vileika. So, here's Molodechno and here's Vileika. Uh, 
By the 22nd of September, the town of Smorgon, here, which is between uh, Molodechny and, and, and uh, Vilno, had been recaptured by a combination of, of the Russian 10th Army offensive, together with the Russians uh, withdrawing from Vilno. The Germans were exhausted and hungry, and most of their artillery and supplies of food and munitions were still be far behind their front. The Russians counterattacked at Vileka on the 23rd of September 1915. The fighting was fierce and the town suffered badly. Some of the heaviest fighting was around the cemetery and the nearby prison, uh, which was actually notorious in 1940 when it was occupied by the NKVD and my dad spent some time there under interrogation following his arrest. Anyway, the Germans were forced to pull back. It was the furthest east the German army had advanced during World War I, but the Russian army recorded it as one of their greatest victories of the First World War. The Germans pulled back to around Lake Naroch and Hindenburg called a halt to any further extension of his eastern front. By the winter of 1915, the eastern front had stabilised along a line bisecting eastern Europe from Riga in the north down to, at that time, uh, neutral um, Romania in the south. Lake Neroc was located in a small salient right on the border. The area was significant to the Tsar for the pre protection of his heartland of Russia, in particular his capital city of Petrograd and the key city of Moscow. By 1916, Russia had regrouped and amassed three army groups under General Alexeyev, with nearly two million troops along its side of the Eastern Front. The Northern Army Group was commanded by General Kuropatkin, the Western Army Group by General Evert, and the Southwestern Army Group by um, the ageing, ineffectual and allegedly senile General Ivanov. Hindenburg, by comparison, had less than a million German and Austrian soldiers at its disposal. He was well aware that the Russian army had only been blooded, and he expected a counter-offensive, which he expected to be at either Riga, uh, Daugavpils or Dvinsk, or Smorgon, each of which had um, a good railway network. Minor fighting and probing raids continued throughout the winter, but in reality, neither the Central Powers nor the Allies considered Russia capable of a major offensive, and the notion of any military uh, offensive was far from the thoughts of Stavka. But with increasing civil unrest at home and disillusionment within the army, their hand was forced on the 21st of February 1916, when the French demanded a Russian offensive in order to divert German troops east to relieve pressure at Verdun. So, in accordance with an agreement instigated by Russia themselves, and designed to prevent them from becoming isolated from their allies, they found themselves bound by their own arguments and in no position to refuse. Alexeyev convened a war cabinet on the 24th of February, and after several days of deliberation, it was decided that an offensive would be carried out on Russia's western front, where their forces vastly outnumbered the Germans. Preparations for the offensive using the 2nd Army of Everett's Western Army Group started immediately. But the Russian army, despite receiving increasing supplies of arms and stores, were lacking in sufficient rifles and were not really prepared for any significant offensive action, and so on March the 1st deadline couldn't be met. To compound matters, the terrain where the troops were concentrated was where they chased the Germans back to, and it was clearly unsuitable but due to the lack of transport, there was no time to regroup elsewhere. Alexeyev ordered the Western Front to begin their offensive on the 18th of March, followed by the 1st Army of the Northern Army Group and the 10th Army of the Southwestern Army Group on the 21st. The Western Army Group was divided into three fronts. General Pleshkov uh, managed the Northern Front from Medzuni, to Postavi, General Cerealius from Postavi to Lake Naroc, and in the south, General Bal Baliev from Lake Naroc down to Vileka. Uh, 
The Russian battle plan seemed a simple classic coordinated pincer movement using the second army attacking on a broad front across the frozen lakes and swamps towards Vilno. It was supposed to have been supported by flanking attacks from the 1st Army in the north and the 10th Army in the south. But there was little confidence in the Russian command, which was heavily criticised from every quarter. Evert, the overall commander in particular, was considered to be overly cautious and commanding his 2nd Army was the aged General Smirnov, who was also widely regarded as being weak and ineffectual. On the 15th of March, just three days before the start of the offensive, Smirnov was removed from command. The official line was that he had taken seriously ill, but many consider it was because he was thought incapable of, of managing the coming offensive. His replacement was a General Rogoza, who was the commander of the Russian 4th Army, and he was completely unfamiliar not only with the 2nd Army, but with the region and terrain of the impending battle. His second army comprised of 368 battalions of about 800 heavy guns. In total, Rogoza had nearly 500,000 men ready for action. But demoralised by bitter defeats and stagnated by personal rivalries, these generals and their command structure seemed devoid of any real offensive ambition, and it's not surprising that inadequate planning, insufficient cooperation, poor communication and bad management ensued. Their army groups, despite intensive preparation, were not quite ready or fully grouped. Heavy guns, small by German standards, but, but, but the heaviest so far used by the Russians, moved to the front too late, and because of this their crews were unfamiliar with the terrain and targets. There was also a constant shortage of shells and poor distribution of food supplies to the front lines. Telephone communications were almost completely lacking, and there was ha hardly any artillery observation. Facing them was the numerically inferior but battle-hardened 10th Army's 21st Army Corps, commanded by General von Hutia with his headquarters at Kabilnik, which is here. He controlled a front of about 100 kilometres. With around 70 to 75,000 men, it was less than a quarter the size of his oncoming Russian opponents. As the Russian build-up continued, German intelligence reported increasing Russian activity, and aerial reconnaissance was quick to spot Russian westerly troop movements and the presence of heavy gun batteries. It was obvious that an offensive was in the offing, and von Hutia quickly moved to counter the Russian threat by increasing the number of trenches, walkways and concrete bunkers. And now this is an interesting photo, and it shows the uh, construction equipment used in these bunkers. Um, so these, these steel sections and, and sandbags or cement. Um, and this is a photo, it was actually t taken on the western front, but it shows the construction of how these bunkers were constructed. And this one, how they were actually used. Um, I, I've made a point here because I'll, I'll come back to this a, a, a little bit later. Anyway. Barbed wire along the front, in fact along the whole of the front, including along the shorelines and across the frozen lakes, was increased from about three strands to twenty, and steel shields and sandbags were positioned to protect vulnerable positions. Russian preparations continued, and this is a photo of uh, observers, uh, the German observers here on the left and the Russian observers on the, on the right. Um, so the Russian preparations continued, and during early March, minor Russian probing attacks attempted to assess the range and the disposition and the strength of the German forces. From the 14th of March, the Russian artillery began ranging their equipment but the Russian final preparations were nothing short of chaotic. And whilst the ground remained frozen, the whole of the front, which is right down from here, right down through Lake Narroch to here. So while the ground remained frozen, the whole of the front was available for their broad infantry and cavalry onslaughts. However, on the 16th of March, the weather changed drastically. Severe winter cold, gave way to an intermittent early sharp spring thaw. Snow blizzards turned into miserable cold sleet and rain. The frozen land changed 
from, from firm underfoot into a sticky, slippery, muddy quagmire. Thick ice on the frozen lakes began to thin and crack, and swollen rivers turned roads and tracks into mud and slush. Moving around, and especially when carrying heavy supplies, became a chore as both sides struggled through the deep, cold mud. Walkways, shelters and trenches on both sides filled as the thawing mud flowed in. The consequences to the Russian army, though, was much more significant. The advantage of the offensive advancing in a broad front across the frozen ground of marshes and lakes evaporated. And here I've coloured uh, all the water red so you can clearly see the number of lakes, all of which were surrounded by boggy marshes and dense forests. The thaw actually limited their attacks to two small gaps between this almost unbroken chain of lakes. To the north of Lake Naroch, they would have to rely on concentrating on an area uh, to the northwest of Postave, which was here. And in the south, um, the only option was between Lakes Narosh and Vizhnev, of which the south and central sections uh, was uh, broken terrain and boggy marshland. So their only option was here, just to the south of Lake Naroch. The offensive began in the early morning of the 18th of March with a massive artillery barrage across the whole of the Russian front. It was some of the heaviest seen on the Eastern Front. It targeted the German front line, barbed wire and trenches as this Russian artillery, t artillery map shows, which is to the south of Lake Naroch. The Germans, even though they were expecting the onslaught, were initially caught by surprise, but retreating into their bunkers and foxholes, they suffered relatively few casualties. German artillery responded slowly at first, but ever, with ever-increasing accuracy, they targeted their opposing gun batteries. As Russian artillery continued to wreak havoc along the front lines, it turned the, 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 the semi-frozen ground into a cratered, muddy morass. Using their cavalry was pointless, so they remained mounted way behind the front. And Baliev unleashed his first infantry into a thick morning mist on the southern shores of Lake Narach, heading for the villages of Blizniki and Zanaroch, which are here. Twelve Russian battalions face just six German. To the north of Pustavi, Pleshkov's troops poured forward through no man's land and swampy forests, forests towards the villages of Mikolushki and Yazevo, which are here. Though the thaw was causing problems for the German frontline trenches, which began filling up with icy cold water, the Russian infantry were also hampered by their own artillery, uh, which was falling on them, and whose craters immediately filled up with thick mud and icy water, hindering their advance. In the centre section, Sir Alias's guns continued to fire, but his infantry divisions stayed put. And this enabled the German army to quickly and easily redeploy their troops in the central section, section as needed. On both wings of the attack, dense lines of troops trudged slowly forward through the darkness and the early morning mist, illuminated by rocket flares and powerful searchlights. Sometimes they became bogged down and sometimes they were slipping on the ice and frozen land and they moved slowly forward in wave after massed wave. Sadly, the Russian artillery commanders had overestimated the effect of the fierce bombardment, which had largely been inaccurate and ineffective. Believing they could batter their way through a small breach in the German front lines, the remaining Russian infantry on both fronts continued to push forward through no man's land in packed groups rather than spreading out. For the coordinated German machine gunners, in their strong and fortified defences, it was an absolute dream. They were able to concentrate their fire on the mass groups of Russian soldiers and an absolute massacre ensued. The Russian attacks pressed on regardless throughout the day, but their advance was hindered by the swampy conditions and a shell cratered landscape which filled up with freezing water. In truly awful conditions, the Russian infantry bravely fought on, often driven from behind by their own gunners, even though their position already seemed hopeless. By nightfall, the first day had ended in complete failure across the whole of the Russian Second Army front. At no point 
had the Russian infantry come anywhere close to breaching any section of the German defences. In fact, the most forward of the Russian infantry had not even been able to advance within 200 metres of the German frontline trenches. In the south, Balayev suffered over 15,000 de deaths around Lake Naroch, and in the north, Pleshkov had also lost more than 10,000 men. Those that were able to made their way back to their starting positions, but thousands of wounded soldiers lay helpless, helpless alongside their dead comrades in the freezing muddy waters of the battlefield. As the night temperatures plummeted, the muddy standing water in the craters froze around the unfortunate Russian wounded. Their screams of agony could be heard all along the German front line. Most of the soldiers that stayed in their advanced positions in the swamps suffered severe frostbite. Their hands were so swollen and painful that they were no, no longer able to hold or operate their weapons. Throughout the night, the Russians continued to harry the German defences with small artillery attacks and patrol operations along the front line in order to prevent the repair of any trenches, or roads or barbed wire. Russian commanders clearly learned no lessons from that first day. Despite being soundly rebuffed and with their fighting spirit severely dented and their troops exhausted, the second day started in exactly the same way as the first, with a huge artillery barrage. Gradually, more heavy Russian artillery was moved into position and began to wreak havoc, particularly around the southern shore of Lake Naroch, Amokritsa, Zanaroch and Blizniki, where the church on the front line was completely devastated. And, and this is the church here. But I'm going to slightly digress a bit here because the church of Blizniki was never rebuilt, uh, but though it's still used as a cemetery. And I've often visited the area. And when I visited the, the church at Blizniki, I noticed in the ruins of the church the grave of two Pleshaks. They're no relation to me, but, uh, but an, an interesting digression, I thought. Anyway, following the sustained artillery barrage, the Russian infantry, though clearly fatigued, again pressed hard against small sections of the battered front. Brutal hand-to-hand -hand fighting continued throughout the day and into the night, and for a short while it seemed that the Russian infantry was making some headway. But as with the previous day, the German defence was too strong and well organised, and by daybreak the German front was restored to its original position, leaving the Russian attackers yet again severely bloodied and bruised. March the 20th began as the previous two days, with a heavy artillery barrage followed by an uncoordinated suicidal mass charge in narrow columns on both wings of the German front. Hutier was reinforced by some of his 10th Army Reserves, and with his backup, he was able to rap rapidly and easily uh, able to deploy his reserve troops and concentrate his fight on each Russian incursion as needed. And as the Russian army persisted in, ta in attacking in narrow groups rather than simultaneously along a broad front, the Russian bloodbath continued. In the north, particularly heavy artillery, which was followed by fresh Russian battle regiments, succeeded in breaching the German front lines in the early hours of the morning. Here, German infantry regiments fought desperately hand-to-hand -to, -hand to hold their ground, and only following the addition of the reinforcements were they able to make good their losses. Despite the carnage, the huge expenditure of munitions and an awful loss of life, Ragoza and his command officers steadfastly refused to alter their tactics. The Russian command presumed that the continual bombardment of the previous three nights had dented the German resolve. So once again, in the early hours of the 21st of March, the Russian artillery began blasting the German frontline positions. Behind the Russian lines, Russian infantry massed for a huge push, hoping that a drop in the temperatures to almost minus 10 degrees Celsius and three days of artillery fire would enable a successful mass assault. In the north, Pleshkov's inf infantry at attack started at five in the morning in sleet, snow and thick fog, and it was mixed with artillery smoke. And yet again, they pushed forward against a narrow section where the German searchlights were only partially able to illuminate them. Despite huge losses, the Russians inched their way forward in truly awful conditions. The Germans fought hard, but eventually conceded about 100 metres of their first front-line trenches, but they rapidly reorganised and they sealed off the incursion and prevented any further advance. In the south, Balayev's infantry onslaught began at 12.30. Aided by dense fog, eight waves of infantry 
once again attacked a small front between the villages of Zanaruch and Mokritska. As in the north, the Russian infantry slowly but finally began to make headway as wave after wave pressed forward against the weary German defenders who eventually began to pull back from their forward positions. First, the Russian infantry moved into the abandoned German front-line trenches, then the second, and then into the third-line trenches. Fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting broke out all along the front, and in particular at the strategic high ground known as Free Mulhoa. The fourth day of the offensive was turning out to be the most successful so far for the Russians, and as the advance made slow progress, small numbers of German prisoners were captured on both wings of the attack. And what you can see here is the German trenches occupied by uh, the Russian infantry. The Germans were quick to regroup and in the south, bolstered by the redeployment of recently arrived reserve division, soon isolated their abandoned trenches that were occupied, occupied by the Russian forces and brought the might of their weaponry to bear mercilessly down from three sides. Unfortunately, the weather, so often an ally to Russia in decisive battles, proved unreliable, and as the German guns relentlessly pounded their former trenches, the slight daytime thaw caused mud and freezing water to flood into the trenches, covering the occupants, sending many of the forward Russian troops to a horrible and miserable death. By the early morning of the 22nd, the Germans had repelled and routed their attackers from all their lost trenches, and though the day had been the most successful of the entire battle for the Russian army, their back, and significantly, their resolve had been broken. To the far north, the Russian 5th Army, which incidentally included my grandfather, was pressed into their commitment of supporting Everett's offensive by attacking Dalgavpils. This too, sadly turned out to be a disaster, as they were thwarted on the first day with the loss of around 28,000 men and many more wounded. The fourth day of the battle had indeed turned out to be decisive, but the advantage was now clearly with the German defenders. A constant Russian bombardment continued along the front, especially in the south around Lake Naroch, but it was of less intensity than had been previously seen. Some sporadic infantry attacks also probed the German defences, and generally there was little success. However, on the 26th of March, following a hard frost which made the terrain easier to traverse, Baliev managed, in horrific hand-to-hand -hand combat, to take the high ground of Fremilhoa from the Germans. However, this was quickly recaptured. Interestingly, using the first documented attack of a new technique known as the fire roller. Widely used in World War II and beyond, it became known as the rolling or creeping barrage. Though the Germans were in fact near breaking point, for the Russians continuing their failure was clearly untenable. By the 28th of March, the Russian High Command believed Despite their overwhelming numerical superiority, any chance of success was limited, and so a partial truce with it was agreed. The Germans buried their dead in graveyards, and the Russians collected their dead from the battlefield. Russian priests moved between the barbed wire, preparing uh, their dead for uh, burial in mass graves in no man's land. Minor skirmishes continued for some time. The exhausted Russian army had suffered over 100,000 casualties in the battle. A further 15,000 died later from frostbite, and thousands more, as you can see from this picture, were taken prisoner. By the middle of April, the German army had recovered all its lost territory, and the Narrowch offensive was effectively brought to a halt. For months after the battle, Russian corpses were still being removed from those German trenches they had stormed only to be incarcerated in mud. The Germans, by comparison, had lost around 20,000 men. So the battle that had begun in order to draw German troops away from Verdun had ended in a disaster. Not only had the Russian army been decimated in battle, partly because of his own aptitude, partly because of certain circumstances, the desired overall effect had not been achieved. There was not a single German army unit redeployed from Verdun to bolster the defences at Lake Naroch. The Russian Imperial Army had been severely bruised in battle yet again, but the consequences of the defeat were much more far-reaching. Stavka blamed the commanders 
for the bad organisation, the artillery for inadequate infantry support and the infantry for lack of aggression. But in reality, many con reasons contributed to the failure. Added to these, Aurelius's reluctance to commit his infantry effectively rendered a third of the front idle. For the old guard elitist Russian military high command, who were loyal to the Tsar, it proved to be a turning point. Many, including Ever and Kuropatkin, were completely demoralised and resigned themselves to defeat, believing that there could be no way of beating the German army, regardless of the numbers of soldiers or supplies they had available. Many of the senior officers in Stavka were overcome with despair, which contributed to the apathy that was evident in the majority of the Russian officer corps towards the end of the war, and it may have led to the armistice with Germany and an early withdrawal from World War I. In major Russian cities, it may have contributed to further civilian and military war weariness and added to the total army disillusionment with the course of the war. It possibly led to an increased civil apathy, an open revolt and even indirectly added to the pressures on the imperial royal family leading to their abdication and eventual murder. It possibly also contribute, contributed to the Russian Revolution and ultimately even contributed to an atmosphere sympathetic to the rise of communism. But changes were afoot. Kuropatkin was eventually relieved of his command. Ragoza was replaced by his predecessor Smirnov, who had miraculously recovered from his pre narach offensive illness. And whilst Narach was the last offensive of the old Russian army, it provided the impetus for a new style, younger and more aggressive thinking officer who believed in modern warfare and offensive tactics. Of these, Brusilov emerged as their brightest star. He replaced Ivanov in April and undertook a successful campaign in June in the south, which was instrumental in the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So, what of Lake Narod following the offensive? The German 21st Army Corps had moved into this beautiful and peaceful peasant backwater in the September of 1915. They had quickly established their headquarters in the small town of Kubilnik, where many of the buildings were pressed into German military use. Even the Russian Orthodox Church of Ilinskaya, which you can see here, was converted into a makeshift field hospital. Here's a few pictures of uh, buildings around Kibilnik. They even constructed a, a railway. This is the uh, Catholic Andreevsky Church. Uh, and despite being an occupying force, the Germans were however, however respectful to the local inhabitants. They set up schools for the children of Kibilnik and at Christmas provided them with presents regardless of their religion. They also helped with the care and well-being of all the locals. I have to add though, it wasn't the case 25 years later when Kibilnik was once again occupied by German forces. The Jewish graveyard there bears testimony to a horrific mass murder. Kibilnik's local manor house was tr transformed into the staff HQ uh, and it was the place of residence for the commander of the 21st Army Corps, General von Hutcher, who can be seen here on, on the patio. And it's also where von Hindenburg stayed when he visited the area. After the Battle of Lake Naroj, there was little fighting in the surrounding area. The Russians buried their dead in mass graves and the Germans established several memorial war cemeteries to bury and honour theirs. Following the withdrawal of Russia from the war in March 1918, more and more German troops were transferred to the west. And after World War I, Poland regained its sovereignty and by February 1919, the last of the German army had departed. Normal life returned to the residents of the region. But as we all know too well, it was only for a short time. Even though peace of sorts had returned, the scars of war remained, particularly in the area that had once been the front line. Deep trenches and concrete fortifications remained, and the dangerous debris of war littered the fields, which had been previously used for agriculture. Farmers struggled to eke out a living, and even fishermen complained of snagging their nets on the barbed wire entanglements that lay beneath the clear waters of Lake Naroch. Even today, over a hundred years after the event, the area around Lake Naroch still bears the scars and many artefacts still litter the area. Here's one of the, the boats used by the Germans at the bottom of the lake. This is the Andreevsky Church, 
it survives almost the same to the present day. And the Orthodox Ilyinskaya Church, which was used as, uh, as a, a field hospital, similarly, has changed little, even inside. And many of the buildings from 1916 still remain. And these barbed wire entanglements, uh, which were known as Spanish riders, have recently been removed from the lake. Of the bunkers that I mentioned earlier, I, mean, I, I, I made the point about these bunkers earlier. Many can still be seen. They're all over the area. And some of the steel shields that they used are still being put to good use on, on many of the local buildings and farms. Even some of the fortif fortifications can still be seen. And though now mostly overgrown, many of the German and some of the Russian trenches are still visible. Two Russian memorials to mark mass graves now exist to honour the event. In the village of Brusy, what was behind the Russian front line, stands a memorial to 400 Russian soldiers. And in Sheremshitsi, another memorial for a mass grave of 700 men. But several impressive German memorials still exist. And it was the German, German eagle adorned monument in the cemetery at Kabilnik that ignited my interest. You can get a, an idea of the size uh, just after its completion in 1916 by this soldier stood by here. Here's a memorial to the heroes of the 250th Reserve Infantry Regiment. It's in the village of Pronki. And another for the 249th Reserve Infantry Regiment at Karabani. And again, you can get an idea of the size of the monument uh, from the soldier here on the right. And here's what's left of it today. Of the manor house, um, there's no trace of it today and interestingly my relatives who live quite nearby never even knew it existed. Um, 2016 was the 100th anniversary of the battle and I was honoured uh, to be invited to take part in a three-day commemoration of the battle uh, with an event where there was events in Minsk, uh, Naroch and Postavi and I was the only non-Russian or Belarusian to actually attend. I raise money for a Belarus charity that supports children in long-term hospital care and I visit Belarus as often as I can. And in 2017, I presented prizes at a competition for a UK-based charity at a high school in Postavi, where I gave a talk to an English class on my hometown of Manchester. Also in 2017, I was invited to a reconstruction of the battle, which was, which was staged at, a, at the Stalin Line Museum in Minsk. And lastly, I'd like to thank my family and friends in Belarus, and in particular, the historians Valery Tadra, which is here, Vladimir Bogdanov, who's written a huge and impressive book on the, on the subject, and Andrei Kark-Kotko. Um, so that's it. The little but perhaps now a little bit better known Battle of Lake Naroch. And for those of you that are still awake, thanks for listening.